I just hadn't started talking yet. I'm not doing that thing again, just so you know. Those of you who aren't here last week, last week uh, we talked about waiting. And uh, so I thought a good way to start a message on waiting would be to make everyone wait. And so I stood up here and I, you know, I made some hand gestures, but didn't say anything for, um, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. It felt like a long time, didn't it? Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, everybody, you know, what's, I tell you what's really great is that I always get uh, feedback, right? I always get feedback, especially about the way we, I begin messages, because, you know, I try to always kind of have a, a creative way to start to connect us to what the scriptures tell us. And, you know, the feedback I got last week was, you know, I thought something was really wrong. I thought, you know, maybe you were whispering, your mic wasn't working. The best, here's the best piece of feedback I got. The best piece of uh, feedback I got was a guy who said, hey man, I was sitting there and thinking, you know, this guy, he's making us all wait out here. Who does he think he is, a doctor? Right? So, it, yeah, I got a lot of feedback. And that's one thing about, about preaching is that I, I always, I can always get feedback from people. But I tell you, it's not just enough to get feedback from other people. Part of what I do is I do self-evaluation where um, every three or four months, I will go and I will listen to myself preach. I'll go online and I'll listen to my sermons. That way I can learn things about how I'm presenting the scriptures. And if I hear something in one sermon that I'm like, hmm, I'm not sure about that. I'll listen to another one. You know, it's, you know, it helps me to become aware of things like I always start my messages by saying, all right. Yeah. Some of you noticed that you didn't say anything. Thanks. Um, but, you know, and I'll try to pick things up, but it's important for me to have self-evaluation. It's important to get feedback from others. Um, and every week I, I look at my message and I go back and I look through my notes and I say, what did I miss? What did I not get right? And it's, it's difficult sometimes. It's difficult, but self-reflection prepares me for what's coming next. It prepares me for the next week. And that's how it is for all of us, is that we have to do some introspection. We have to look at ourselves critically from time to time to be prepared for what's coming next. This morning, we're going to, we're going to center our thoughts around the idea of preparation in this Advent season, because there was much preparation that was made for the Messiah to come into the earth. And so we're going to look today at a passage of scripture that's not always preached at, during the Advent season. We're going to look in the book of Mark chapter 1. And you say, wait, Mark doesn't have a story about the baby Jesus. You're right. It doesn't. But it does have an amazing story about preparations that were made for Jesus. So I'm going to start reading in Mark chapter 1 verse 1. And this is how it begins. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Now, last week we looked at that whole genealogy, that long list of this one begat, that one begat, that one. And we said that that was for a Hebrew or a Jewish audience because it was important to them to understand where Jesus fell in line in connection to Abraham and David, where, where he was in all of that, right? But Mark is not written for a Hebrew audience. It is written for a Gentile or a Greek audience, right? Or, or even a Roman audience. It wasn't written for a Jewish audience. So they don't care who begat whom. They don't care about that at all. What they want to see is what is, who does Jesus say that he is? And then they want, they want him to prove it. They, they're sort of like Missouri, you know, show me, show me who Jesus is. Show me what Jesus did. That's what their interest is. And so it, Mark begins his gospel. And he says this, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This is from Isaiah chapter 40, but it's also the same passages or the same words are used in Malachi. And we talked about some of them that, that God sent not just his son into the world, but sent one before him to be one who prepares the way. Now, this idea of one who prepares the way is not something that happens a lot in our, well, 
really at all in our culture. But in, in this culture, when someone of royalty would be going from one place to another, going, say, from the capital out to a village or something, they would send someone ahead of time. Right, they'd send someone ahead of time. I guess sort of like the president, the Secret Service sends an advanced team to scout the place to make sure everything's safe. He would send someone ahead of time and that person would have a couple of responsibilities. One of them was to announce the fact that the king is coming. Right, he would announce, the king is coming. And some of you, you know, if you work in a place that has a boss that sometimes disappears, you know, maybe you'll post somebody next to the door. You post somebody next to the door and they'll say, the boss is coming, right? Look busy. And that's kind of the idea. The king is coming. So everybody be on your best behavior, right? Don't, don't tr try, to, try to not look so much like peasants or whatever, right? The king's coming. So he would announce that the king is coming. But the other thing that, that they would do is that the king would have been traveling in uh, you know, a wagon, a, a carriage of some sort. And so they would look at the pathway. They would look at the road and the quality of it, how it is. And if there was a part that was too high, they would lower it. If there was a pothole, they would fill it so that they would make the way straight or make the path smooth for the king. And this is the role of John the Baptist. This was the role of John the Baptist, that he was the one who was to prepare the way. He was to clear the path. He was to fill in the holes. Now, we don't, again, we don't have this really in modern day. I'll say maybe the, as I was thinking about it, the closest I could come up with it is that, you know, the path that I run in the morning is very prone to like, like limbs and things falling on it. And there's oftentimes people will like push their, their lawn debris and they'll put it on the sidewalk. And I just kind of like, you know, I'm running and I just like kind of parkour over it or whatever. And you know, there's this one spot though between the junior high and then back where I turn at uh, Bear Path, I think it is. And there are a bunch of limbs that are always falling there. They're always on the path. A couple of you run that place and you know what I'm talking about. There's always these limbs. And I was like, Haley, you know, what I need to do is I need to just carry with me like a machete so that I can clear the path. And she was like, yeah, that sounds great. A big guy dressed in all black running by the junior high with a machete. I'll, I'll make sure to set the you know, recorder to record the news that night, right? But somebody, I don't know who, somebody cleared the path. Somebody has taken all those things out. It makes the running experience much better for me and everybody else that runs there. And that's what John the Baptist is doing for Jesus. He's making it to where the people are ready to receive Jesus's message. This isn't, his message isn't a competing message. It isn't a competing message. He's not saying that I'm going to raise my disciples and they will in some way be opposed or apart or separate from Jesus' disciples. On the contrary, everyone that John is reaching should end up being a disciple of Jesus Christ. He's preparing the people for Jesus. He's making the way clear. And so this is how he did it. In verse four, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, he is baptizing in the wilderness. In fact, the word that's used there is uh, Jeshimon, and it, it means the devastation. Ooh, that's real creepy sounding, right? He's preaching out in the devastation. It was an area between Jerusalem and Judea, in this sort of wilderness, deserted land, where there was nothing. And this is the place where he chooses to preach. Now, part of that is the fulfillment of Scripture, to, that he would be the voice crying out in the wilderness. But there's there's an, a reason why the prophet said that there would be a voice crying out in the wilderness, and that's because of what the wilderness represented to Israel. Right? What the re wilderness represented to Israel is where you go when you have been rebellious. Right? That, that's, that's what happened. The children of Israel are wandering. They're going to the promised land. They have a chance to go in. They rebel, and God says, nope, 40 years, you're in the wilderness. Right? Modern parlance might say he's the voice of one crying out from, from time out. Right, from, from the hall where the teacher has sent him. But John hasn't been pushed out into the wilderness. He has chosen the wilderness because his message to them is clear. Israel, you are in rebellion. You're in rebellion. You are disobedient. Your hearts are far from the Lord. And if you're going to come back, you've got to recognize that. If you're going to return to the God that loves you, you have got to own the fact that you are in rebellion. And so he cries out in the wilderness. 
And he brings them, he calls them out to the wilderness, admitting their rebellion and calling them to baptism for repentance. Baptism for repentance. We're going to dig into that repentance in just a bit. Let's go on to verse 5. Verse 5 says, All the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. All the countryside and Jerusalem. It's estimated that as many as 300,000 people went to hear John the Baptist preach. As many as 300,000 people were baptized in the Jordan. And this is it, that they made confession. And their confession acknowledged their sin. They acknowledged their sin and they admitted their need for forgiveness. Notice something. John is not promising that forgiveness. He's not promising that forgiveness. In fact, we're going to see that he knows exactly what his baptism is worth in just a minute. But he's not guaranteeing forgiveness from their sins. He's just asking them to admit that they have them and that they need someone to save them. And so verse 6 he says, now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He's doing this so that he is set apart from the mainstream. Even though John by right could have been in service at the temple because of his lineage, he rejected that. He was not at the temple. He was not at this place where this uh, religious central hub of Israel was taking place. He rejected that notion. He pulled apart from the mainstream because he recognized that what was happening in Jerusalem was godlessness, that it was self-righteousness that it was self-serving and that it was wicked. And so he goes to the wilderness and he takes on the clothing of a nomad. He takes on the clothing of the very poor. Now, sometimes we, we really get hung up on this locust and honey aspect, right? Because that does not sound appetizing at all, right? That's like an episode of Survivor or something. Like that's not for us. Um, there are a couple of different ways to understand this. It is possible that he was actually eating locusts, the bugs. There was also a bean that was called a locust bean. Again, it was something that grew wild and was something that was eaten by very, very poor people. Then the honey, it could have been that he just had a lot of beehives, but also there was a sweet sap that ran out of a tree that was referred to as honey. It could have been that. What, what's important for us to recognize isn't his crazy diet. Let's not get distracted by that. What's important is to recognize that his diet was humble that his diet was of the very poor, that he was not out there, he was not out there making 300,000 disciples to make much of himself. He never leveraged his fame, his notoriety, he never leveraged any of that for his own personal gain. But instead he said, everything I have, it is all pointing to Jesus. It is all pointing to Jesus. And I think there is in there, I, could, I feel like I could stop right there. I could camp out here for a while and just say, is that where we are? I gotta tell you, in my own self-reflection, I have to ask that of myself. Is that my call? Am I trying to build a church or am I trying to grow disciples for Jesus? Am I trying to grow Sunday school classes or am I trying to make disciples for Jesus? Is this for me or is it for him? And sometimes we get confused on those two. It's pretty easy to do. John wasn't confused. He understood his role. He understood his role, and Jesus understood his role also. Jesus understood who John was. In fact, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus talks about John, and he says, he calls him the one who is sent. He calls him Elijah. He says that Elijah has come to declare that the Son of Man is coming in fulfillment of Malachi chapter 4. He says, God sent Elijah to you, and you mistreated him. He said, God sent Elijah to you, and some people went out and they were baptized and they repented, but, but you religious folks, oh, you missed it. You treated him badly. You treated him like some sort of reject. You treated him like a fool. You let him be turned over have his head chopped off. Oh, he's, God sent you Elijah to prepare the way and you missed it. Jesus understood exactly who John the Baptist was. In verse seven, John showed himself. He preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, 
the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. You see, he appeared powerful. He appeared powerful. The Roman government must have feared John. They must have anyone that could draw that kind of audience in that time was a threat to the rule. He was a threat to the the ruling class. He absolutely was. Anyone who could draw that kind of audience, people had to pay attention to. He seemed powerful. He had deep connections to thousands of people. I've actually heard people here have said, Pastor Chip, you know, you're my pastor, but... I just, you know, I want you to know that brother so-and-so is, he'll always have a special place in my heart because he baptized me, he baptized my kids, he married my, my daughters, and, right? And I absolutely get it because, you know, I have a brother David who baptized me after I finally convinced him he needed to, right? It took me a long time to work that up. But I, I've got that, I've got somebody, and there there's, will always be this connection there There was that connection. There was that Pastor Lynn connection to John for three, for a quarter of a million people, the entire, more than the entire population of Beaumont loved this man. He was so powerful. And yet his message was one of humility. And he says, as powerful as you think I am, the army that I could raise in defiance of this Roman government, the army that I could raise is nothing compared to the one who comes after me. His message was one of humility. His message was simply, I am unworthy. So don't praise me. Don't exalt me. Please don't put stock in me. Put stock in the one who is coming after me. And this, this is a message that the world needs from us. The world needs Christians who are not self-aggrandizing. The world needs pastors who are not self-aggrandizing. Friends, if I have ever given you the impression that I am something special, I apologize. If I've ever given you the impression that I have some shred of holiness that comes from anywhere other than the blood of Jesus, I, I misled you. Because it is, it's not me. I'm, I am unworthy. One day when I see Jesus, I will fall at his feet. And I would beg to touch his feet. I would not assume to be able to wash them. That's the message our world needs from all of us. It needs to know that we as followers of Jesus, that we are unworthy, that what has been done for us was apart from us. That was John's message. And he said this in verse eight, I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Him saying that he baptizes with water is, he's saying that that his baptism is is preparatory. That it's with water, it's, it's a preparation for something that's coming. That it's preparatory, but the baptism that's coming, that Jesus is bringing, it's not preparatory, it is ultimate. It is ultimate. His baptism is only going to be temporary, but Jesus' baptism is going to be permanent. The baptism that that John brings is exterior. You would go into the Jordan River and you would come out a little cleaner than you went in. But what Jesus is doing is he is washing from the inside out. He is making us completely clean through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This was the message of John the Baptist and this was the the, the way that was prepared for Jesus coming. There are, I think the heart of his message is, is repentance. It's repentance and it's, it's something that we, it's a word that we use a lot, but I wanna take a little time to really break down what it means. Because I think we live in an age um, where we see and we hear repentant people, we hear repentance, but then we don't actually see it lived out. Here's what, 
Here's what repentance means. It, it literally, the word means to change your mind. And I think that maybe that's the, the sort of narrowest understanding of that or the simplest understanding of that has misled us. Because, you know, this afternoon after church, I might go to Mongolian Grill. But the kids might say, oh, not Mongolian Grill. Let's go to Mazio's. And I could change my mind. That's not repentance. That's not repentance. And sometimes the way people talk about repentance, it seems like they've just kind of changed their mind from one thing to another. Maybe I want this, maybe I want this. But it's much deeper. It's much deeper than that. It's, to change is your mind, it means to literally to change your brain. It means to change not just one of your thoughts, but to change the way you think. It means to change not just what you want in your heart, but to change out your old heart for a new one. It isn't just a, a changing of, of thinking, but changing how you think. And as I see it, it involves really three parts. And the first part is where we began this morning, that of self-examination. Self-examination. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is, that should be part of our prayer daily. Search me. Search my heart. Know my heart. Now, there is probably no one else that we would give that invitation to. We love our spouses. We love our kids. Our kids love us. But with our kids, with our spouses, there's always this sort of balance. Do I tell everything? No, I probably shouldn't tell everything. I'll, I'll tell most. I'll tell most. I'll share most of my heart with this person, but not everything. I'm going to I'm gonna hold back just a few things because there's probably a few things that wouldn't be beneficial to them. We can talk ourselves. It wouldn't be beneficial for them. And let's be real. Sometimes that's right, right? Like sometimes that kid of mine makes me go nuts. I'm talking about one of them that's not here right now. Just a different one, um, right? That kid makes me, right? We might think that but it would probably be damaging to his self-esteem if we said that. And so we, we kind of, we hold that back. But what the psalmist is saying here with God is he's saying all of it. Lord, look inside. Look inside, search my heart, search my mind, search all of it. Know me completely. And if there's, if there's any offense, if there's something that I've gotten wrong, if there's something that I've done wrong, show me. Bring it to the fore so that I can know. Bring it out so that I can change, so that I can deal with it. Because we trust him completely. We talked about how he is the refining fire, that he is the refiner, the one who makes us pure. And so we trust him with it, and we have to trust him with all of it. Here are three questions. Here are three questions that I think are important for us to ask. One is, what have I done? What have I done today? And if you're serious about this process of self-examination, you, you ask these several times a day. What have I done today? Have I, have I done something to hurt someone? Have I done something to offend someone? Have I done something that was contrary to scripture. What have I done today? What have I, second, what have I thought today? Did I think about anger? Did I think about hatred? Did I think about lust? What, what were my thoughts today? And then the third is maybe the hardest, and that is what have I neglected today? Not just what sins have I committed, but what things have I omitted? What are things have I not done that I should have done? What mercy could I have shown that I didn't? What kindness could I have given that I didn't? What love did I withhold? What have I done? What have I thought? What have I forgotten? What have I neglected? 
after we do that work of self-examination, the next part is that we have to, we have to employ confession. Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4, David is, is writing this, and this is a, a public psalm. He is sharing with the world what is in his heart. And this is after he is... <laughs> after he has committed adultery, after he has murdered a man through warfare, after that, his confession in verses three and four are, for I know my transgressions. He knows his transgressions because he's allowed the Lord to search his heart. He says, I know my transgressions. My sin is always before me. And then he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. And we hear that last verse, that against you and you alone have I sinned. And that sometimes that's real hard to swallow, isn't it? Because I'm like, I read that and I think, uh, you know, I think Uriah the Hittite, who you murdered, would probably disagree. He would probably say that you sinned against him too. You know, I think that Bathsheba might would say that you maybe sinned a little bit against her too. But his, what he's saying here is he's saying, listen, Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba, they are sinners just like me. They were conceived in iniquity just like I was. They're sinful, broken people just like me. And their sin and my sin, yeah, they hurt, we hurt each other, but ultimately our sin is offensive to you. Ultimately our sin, ultimately our sin is offensive to God because he is holy. You can, you can say whatever you want to about me, Right, and I'm like, oh, I'll get offended. You might really hurt my feelings. But I don't have the standing of holiness to convict you. I don't sit on the throne to give judgment on you. So your sin, my sin, it is first, it is foremost, it is against God. Sometimes I think it would be easier if our sins were just against other people, right? If I could just sin against you and then you forgive me or you don't. You forgive me and we're cool and we kind of move forward or you don't forgive me and I just stop hanging out with you. You don't forgive me and I'll just, you know, kind of ignore you in public and you ignore me in public. And then, you know, like, I'll have to sit in the third, you know, section instead of the second section, right? I can just kind of move away, create some distance, whatever, and that'll be okay. But it's not that we just sin against each other. It's that we sin against a holy God. And we need to confess that sin. That sin, that transgression, it needs to always be before us because he will judge and when he judges, he is justified in his judging. And then there is the last. And I think each of these get more difficult when it comes to repentance. Self-examination is hard. Confession is harder. And this is perhaps the hardest element of this. And it's change. You don't even have to call it change. We could call it growth. That may be better. Call it growth. Growth. Because if we see our sin, if we examine ourselves and God reveals to us what is in here, we confess it to him, we ask for his forgiveness in that confession, and then we grow. Then we, we change. And this is the part where our world really misses it. This is the part where probably we all really miss it. Is that I sin and I forget, forget, confess and I'm forgiven and then, oh, again and again, and again. And we, run in this, and we run in this cycle of sin and forgiveness and restoration and sin and forgiveness and restoration, but ultimately what, what we're called to do is to grow. And this is the part that John couldn't preach about. See, this is, this is the part that John couldn't, couldn't give people. He could baptize them with water, but he could not baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And if you and I are going to grow, if we're going to change, if we're going to mature as believers, it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we do that. It isn't just that you and I can dedicate our minds to say, nope, I'm just going to be different. I'm going to make a mental note to be different. 
It can't even be, I'm going to look in my heart and I'm going to feel different. What we have to do is have to say, spirit that is within us, change us from the inside out. That's what we need. That's the one thing, that's the one thing that John could not give the people. And it was the thing that only Jesus could. It was the thing that only Jesus could leave us. That is our, our inheritance from him, is this Holy Spirit, this helper to be with us, to guide us in this life and prepare us for life in the hereafter. My friends, this season, as we celebrate Christ's coming, it's really easy to think about all of the lights and the songs and those things and very easy to neglect this thing, and that is that Jesus coming, if we're, if we're going to be ready for Christmas, if this Christmas is going to be great, that we need to use this as a season of preparation. And our preparation hinges on one thing, and that is repentance. Yeah, okay, I'm not gonna stand at the doors at the candlelight service and say, oh, you wanna get in? Have you repented of your sins? Have you repented of your sins? Convince me that you're repentant. I'm not. I don't think I'm going to do that. I don't plan on doing that right now, but as I, as I talk about it, I don't know. I might need to talk to some deacons after this. Anyway, um, I'm not going to do that. But here's what you and I have to do is we have to do that on our own. If Christmas is going to be meaningful, as meaningful as it ought to be, if this celebration of God coming to man is going to be what it's supposed to be, then we have to have a way that is prepared. And it only comes through repentance. It only comes through self-examination, confession, that prepares us for the growth that comes in Christ Jesus. This morning, as I've talked about this process, as I've talked about how it is that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, there may be some of you that, that don't know that. You may have been going to church, you may have been hearing messages and things, and, and have never made this commitment to follow Jesus Christ, to make room for the Spirit in your heart. If that's where you are today, in just a moment, this altar will be open. I will be here and I would love nothing more than this day and this season to begin a deep relationship between you and your heavenly father who sent his son here for you. Let's pray together. Most gracious heavenly father, we thank you. We thank you that you did not just send your son, but that you prepared the way, that you sent a message of repentance that you sent a son for our redemption. Lord, we are not worthy. We are not worthy of you. We are not worthy of the gift you gave, of the blood you spilled, of the life that was lost. And yet, you gave it anyway. Lord, we doubt you. You tell us that you have a plan for us, for a hope and a future, and we, we accept it on a level and we reject it on another. You call us to repent, and we let that message fill our minds, but never change our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would search us, that you would search our hearts, that you would know us, that all the offense that is within us, that you would bring to the front of our thoughts, that we would confess our sin and that we could grow. Lord, we do not know what the future holds, but we trust that you hold it. Lord, if there's any here who 
does not know you as the one who holds their future, I pray that your spirit begin moving in their heart today, that today would be the day of their salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as we have this time open for invitation.